Um, thanks for coming to Machine Learning Lunch. Um, today we have our very own Zico Coulter. He'll uh, talk to us about how we'll have I'm expecting a longer introduction because I'm still eating my cookie. Thank you, though. All right, it's great to be here. It's a wonderful audience. Um, I'm going to talk today about L1 algorithms and energy systems, which is like an odd combination, I know, but bear with me. I hope to make connections and hopefully can motivate you in both ways to think that these algorithms are great for L1 problems and that you should all work in, in applications and energy systems. Um, so before I jump into kind of the meat of the talk, I do want to give a little bit of background of my group as a whole and the kind of work we do and what I mean by energy systems, because that sounds like kind of an odd thing to bring up as your first point in a machine learning talk. So um, when I say energy and sustainability, it's kind of terms that are thrown around a lot when it comes to uh, sort of new areas of research. Um, I'm really talking about very, I, I'm intentionally being broad, I guess, when I say these terms. So I'm intentionally talking about how we can use computation to do things like use less energy or maybe generate more, say, carbon-free energy or make more use of the energy that we are generating. Um, and under these, of course, there's a whole ton, ton of things you could do. You could try to be smarter about how you consume stuff. You could uh, develop new technology for storage or for wind, et cetera. And I think that there's a pretty good appreciation, probably amongst a lot of people here, that these are important problems, I'll say, right? Uh, I think a lot of people agree that these are, you know, problems that need to be addressed. What might be less clear, though, is what we all can be doing. Um, what, what's computer science about these problems, and where can we have an impact here? And I won't give some general unified theory on this. I'll try to prove this point by giving certain examples. And I want to give several examples of the work we're doing in our group that are trying to have an effect on areas like this. So, <clears throat> We're working on a bunch of different things, two of which I'll mention today, if we have time. I'm not sure I'll get to the, to the second one today, but two, two of which I'll mention, but others which I won't mention today, except very briefly in passing right now. So one thing I've worked on a lot is this problem of energy disaggregation. And to motivate this briefly, what this problem addresses is we are getting more and more data from power meters in people's homes. Right? So people are installing these things called smart meters in their homes, or other utilities are installing them. And the question is, what can we do with all this data about energy consumption that we're getting? When you see a graph like this, and, and, and I tell you this is your energy consumption, it isn't very helpful for people, because they just sort of, sort of see this, they don't really know what, what's going on, they don't really know how to use that information to make better decisions. If, though, we can go from a graph like that to an actual breakdown, and it's kind of hard to read here, but essentially what's happening here is we're breaking down that energy consumption by the different appliances that it belongs to. If we tell people this is how much you spend on different appliances and when you're spending that, that's much more useful to people and people do a much better job of just sort of automatically using less energy when they have that information. And to do this, we've developed some algorithms based on models called factorial hidden Markov models. Um, and, and essentially, the, the, the upshot of all this is that our methods can do a much better job at providing these breakdowns than previous approaches. Uh, I've also done some work on data collection for this problem. So one big issue with this is, that despite the fact that there is lots of data, uh, is that not a lot of it's freely available, because utilities don't release this. It all has privacy concerns, et cetera. So one thing we've done is actually develop a public data set for this problem, where we have both the whole home data and the actual breakdown by appliance that this is using, that each appliance is using. And we've done a lot of work sort of analyzing and developing our new algorithms on that data set. Um, I've also done some work with, this is a little bit further afield, but kind of in the, in the space of a single uh, generation, now in particular a, a single wind turbine. Um, I've done some work in wind turbine control. Uh, so this was actually my old office uh, when I was a postdoc, and I built a wind turbine above my desk here. And essentially, what's special about this is that the blades on this turbine you can control very, very quickly. And you can actually control them over one revolution, even though it's spinning very fast there. You can make them sweep out a pattern to try to extract more energy from the wind. The challenge here is that we don't have a very good model of this system. And so doing that in the absence of a good model of the system is very hard. And we're using reinforcement learning methods to help us do this. 
And finally, um, I've done some work and continuing to do some work on larger scale energy analysis. So if we have a whole city, for example, uh, and this was a city, this especially was Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, can we use all this data to get estimates of how much, how much energy people should be using and then be able to tell them from that where they lie in sort of the, the range. Are you using a lot of energy, not much, et cetera, and what can you do to actually affect your usage uh, from that? So these are all kind of, I think, problems that combine some element of data analysis where we want to analyze data or learn on some system, uh, but they are problems that can have an immediate impact and effect on energy and how we consume energy. So there are only a few examples, uh, but I think they kind of reflect this, this possible pairing of two disciplines. And I think the fact that we're getting more data from these systems and we're getting more and more systems we can control makes these kinds of problems more and more prevalent as we go forward. But now what I'm talk what I'm talk about, talk about today is actually two applications that are a little bit different, um, but they both relate to energy. And they both use a common theme of exploiting sparsity when it comes to the actual algorithms that we're going to use here. And so because of that, I'm actually going to kind of do a talk that's backwards from how most talks should be. Um, this is a machine learning audience I know. And so instead of introducing the application first and describing why this is a great thing and then talking about, well, we're going to solve with this algorithm, I'm just going to sort of jump right into the algorithm itself. Um, because I imagine that most people here are familiar with this algorithm or this uh, optimization problem setting, at least, I'll say. Uh, if you're not, it might be a tough talk to follow, but I'll describe it a little bit in more detail. So hopefully, most people here have some sense of what I'm talking about. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about an algorithm which is only recently, I think, starting to get its proper appreciation. And these are methods called Newton coordinate descent methods. Uh, and as far as I can tell, for certain classes of L1 problems, they are just so much better than anything else that we have that everyone should know about them. That's the first part of the talk. The second part, I'm going to now go to the applications and back to energy systems. I'm going to talk about how we're going to use these algorithms, this newton coordinate descent algorithm, to learn models for energy forecasting and for uh, smart grid control, a distributed smart grid control. And I'll say what I mean by those two things also. But first, let's jump in and start talking about optimization. So first of all, um, who here, just by a show of hands to see how far off base, I can't change the talk at this point, but who here knows about L1 optimization, just by a show of hands? OK, good. So the problem we have, and if, and if this is not familiar to you, it might be, it might be tough to, to follow this. Um, it's a machine learning lunch and sort of informal, so I, I, I'm hoping everyone here has at least seen this before. The idea is we have an optimization problem, which is minimize some function of, of, of uh, x subject to a penalty on the, or not subject to, but plus a penalty on the L1 norm of x. OK, and this is uh, sort of almost, probably people started thinking about this about 15 years ago now, or 20 years ago almost. Um, and, and it's become kind of this ubiquitous problem in machine learning, right? And the reason for this is that the L1 norm when you penalize the L1 norm, you tend to get solutions x that have mostly zero elements that are sparse. This is very good from a computational and kind of from an intuitive standpoint, too. Um, so I'm going to assume people at least have seen that before and are interested in solving that problem and maybe even have played with solving that problem before a little bit in their own research. Um, the standard examples are L1 regularized linear regression or logistic regression or other, these, these other algorithms that sort of are all of the form, minimize some function plus a, an extra, an extra uh, L1 penalty here. OK, so this talk is, so, I'm, so very briefly again, sort of the point of that is it encourages sparse results for your, your x variable. People like it for that reason. Um, I'm actually not going to talk at all about why we want to do this in this talk. Um, a little bit, I guess, in, 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 the, in the second part. But in particular, I'm not going to talk about the pros and cons of L1 methods versus other feature selection methods. Right? You can select features in a lot of ways. You can you know, use greedy methods. You can use forward, backward methods. All these things are fine. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm just going to talk about if we want to solve that problem, what should we do? By the way, also interrupt me at any point if you have questions. Um, we, can get, we don't have to get through all the slides today, so. 
rather more people follow the first bit than, than and, and miss them at the end, it's OK. OK, so I want to solve that problem. Um, now let me give you a little preview of the results to come. So we're going to solve a problem like this. And I haven't defined the problem at all. But we're going to solve a problem like this where x is about 4 million, has about 4 million variables. And what I'm plotting here on this axis uh, is distance from uh, our current point in the algorithm to the optimal point. And the scaling doesn't really matter here. Um, sort of depends on how you scale the objective. But you'll see in a second why it doesn't really matter. So if we, if we, what I'm showing here is a, is a graph of time versus distance to the optimum. This is sort of the standard way you, you illustrate the performance of optimization, of optimization algorithms, right? Is how close do you get to the true solution as a function of time? And what I'm showing now is a method called OWL quasi Newton. It's sort of a standard off the shelf algorithm you can apply to these problems, not ours. It's another algorithm that people have, have developed. Um, applied to this problem which will go unnamed, but it's the first of the two applications I'm going to talk about, with about 4 million parameters. So x is 4 million dimensional here. Not the biggest thing you can get, but, but reasonable. Um, here's the performance of this OWL quasi-Newton method. Uh, here is the performance of a method called FISTA. So FISTA is a, what's called a proximal gradient method. Uh, it's, I think, actually a homework assignment in the machine learning course. So if you take the machine learning course, you've implemented FISTA, probably on a problem similar to this, if not exactly the same as this. And it does a little better. You know, we're getting actually pretty good solutions here by about 6,000 6, seconds or so. So it's, it's reasonable. Um, and then here is the performance of the Newton coordinate descent method. So there, <laughs> there really is, is um, for certain problems here, uh, there really is no reason to use anything else. Uh, it's just so much faster. It will get you to the exact solution in seconds as opposed to potentially a lot longer, hours for some other things. Again, I'm not going to sort of uh, debate whether or not you need, you know, how close you want to get to the objective, how much you really need to be. We're, we're assuming here you want to optimize this. And if you want to optimize it, this is a really good way of doing that. All right, so that's how it works, or that, that's what it does. Now I'm going to talk about how it works. So let's kind of go through the steps of different complexities of functions we might want to solve with L1 regularization, and also talk about how you go about solving that. So the simplest case that I can think of of an optimization problem with L1 regularization is when you want to solve essentially a projection. You have some vector y, and you want to find the x is closest to y subject to an L1 constraint, or subject to this penalty on the L1 norm of x. I'm not writing the L1 penalty, but whenever I write f of x there, we're always optimizing that plus the, plus the L1 norm term. And it turns out that actually there's a closed form solution for this problem. It's, it's done by soft thresholding, which again is probably something that a lot of you have learned in, in the machine learning course you've taken. Um, essentially what you do is you just sort of, you, you, you take the absolute value of y, you subtract off lambda. If that, goes, if that makes you less than zero, then the term is zero. Uh, otherwise, you keep whatever that the, you know, whatever's left of this term, essentially. So that's, that's nice. That's easy, right? But now, if we go a little bit one step beyond, and instead of having just a projection like this, um, we have some quadratic function as our objective. And now, all of a sudden, uh, we have a lot of options to choose from. And if you're coming across this all for the first time, you may be very confused as to what options you should take because there are various papers talking about the, the wonders of each of these approaches here. So one of them, and I'll just go through, I'm not going to explain how they work because they all are a little bit involved, um, some less than others. But essentially, there's methods called least angle regression. That is a uh, method that actually proceeds down the entire solution path to give you analytical solutions of what x is for every single different parameter theta. Sorry. It's a different parameter lambda. Um, proximal gradient methods, they essentially they take a little gradient step. They're like gradient descent. They take a gradient step, and then they follow that with a soft thresholding update. That is, that, that's applied to this algorithm. That's what they do. Or th this problem, that's what they do. It's also called uh, something called splitting methods, like ADMM, the alternating direction method of multipliers, which has become hugely popular recently. Um, and that essentially iterates between solving an L2 problem and then soft thresholding. 
So what a lot of these things are doing, you'll notice, is that, and then I guess I'll, I'll just mention the last one because it's been the same thing. Uh, the, the last one I'll talk about, which is actually really sort of a simple algorithm, which nonetheless does really well, is called coordinate descent. And that's a very simple approach. You just take <laughs> each coordinate in your x vector, and you solve for that, for that coordinate. It turns out, even for the case of quadratic functions, you can actually solve for a single coordinate using a, a soft threshold. You just to take some, some operation in the soft threshold bit, and that gives you the solution for that one, um, assuming everything else is fixed, and you just iterate this process over all of them. So one thing that's kind of nice that you'll notice here is that a lot of these methods they exploit the fact that you can solve the soft threshold, or that you can solve the projection case with the soft threshold operator. And they kind of do it in different ways, though. So proximal gradients sort of take a, pro uh, a projection or the soft threshold after the gradient. Splitting methods do this iteration between soft thresholding and, and easier L2, uh, L2 problems. And then coordinate descent sort of does a soft thresholding on each coordinate individually and iterates over that. The one exception would be, I think, Lars doesn't really do soft thresholding. It's hard to interpret it that way, but it's a nice algorithm, too. Are there any questions? No. Who here has seen these before? I'm trying to get a sense of the audience. OK, maybe like half. All right. What these are all relying on is the fact that for this quadratic function in particular, you can actually solve certain subproblems that you might want to solve analytically with this soft thresholding operator. So now let's go one step. And, and for that, actually, before we go one step beyond, um, for this, which is the best of these? Well, they're actually all OK. Uh, and they all work well in different situations. But if you trust, want to trust, um, don't try to take my word for it. Take uh, Trevor Hasty's word for it. He's done a lot of work on these things. He should know. He's a statistician at Stanford. He's done a lot of this. Um, he's just one person, by the way. A lot of people would agree with him here. Some people might, might disagree, too. But um, There's been a ton of work on this. There's been a lot of different algorithms. And the current, or a current thought, I guess, is that when it comes to a combination of just simplicity and speed and all these things, it's really, really hard to beat coordinate descent on these things. You have to have some tricks, certainly. You have to do tricks like, uh, remember, L1 penalizes values, so it's a lot of them to zero. You have to do things like um, you know, only iterate over the non-zero entries for a while first, and things like this. But if you do all those tricks, it works really, really well. Um, and essentially, I probably should have shown this in the last slide, but it boils down to essentially soft thresholding certain things where you sort of an analytic update for each one. OK, so that's great. Um, we can solve these things fast. But it is kind of restricted, because this is only for the, the quadratic loss function that this is sort of has this nice, simple form here. Um, and so what happens now when we have non-quadratic, but still convex and still smooth costs? So I'm, I'm only going to still talk about smooth functions here. I'm not talking about uh, functions that are too nasty. or I guess some of them are actually going to be non-convex if we get to the third part, but um, we'll see. It's still smooth in all cases, I guess. Um, so some examples would be logistic loss here. So just our logistic function here that we want to minimize. Uh, this is if we have a classification problem. The, probably the most well-known non-quadratic uh, non cost, actually, would be this term here, which, which comes up in the graphical lasso. This is a log determinant term plus a trace term of x. Uh, that comes up if you're trying to learn the structure, the graphical model structure of a Gaussian random variable, a multivariate Gaussian random variable. Um, it turns out that this x here corresponds to the inverse covariance of that Gaussian random variable. And if you solve this problem with an L1 constraint, what you're doing is you're learning a Gaussian random variable that has a sparse set of weights in the inverse covariance, which corresponds to sort of uh, directly to the conditional independencies in that Gaussian random variable. So essentially, if you have a thing that has very sparse inverse covariance, um, it means there's, there's lots of conditional independent structure in that Gaussian random variable. And this is a, a method called the, it goes by a lot of names. Um, 
sparse inverse covariance estimations is another one that it goes by, but the graphical lasso is, is a sort of typical name that it goes by. Now, the interesting thing here is that you could apply, so some of the other ones, the algorithms we have before will actually will apply directly. So things like ADMM and proximal gradient methods, those will apply directly to these things. And they kind of work okay. Sometimes they will actually work pretty well. But coordinate descent methods actually don't work very well anymore. Pure coordinate descent. Uh, and it's sort of interesting to see why that happens. And the reason it happens is that coordinate updates no longer have a closed form anymore. Their closed form update derived entirely from the fact that we were optimizing this quadratic function. And actually that's not that bad in the case of logistic loss here, but it's really bad for the graphical lasso. And the reason why is that you could change the coordinate updates from, you know, instead of maybe doing a full coordinate exact update, something like, like a Newton step on the coordinates, on each coordinate individually, you take a Newton step or something like that. Um, the problem here is that to do that, you have to recompute the gradient or Hessian every time you do a coordinate update. Um, and that's really bad because, for example, to compute the gradient of this thing, you have to invert x. That's already costing you order n squared operations if x is n by n, um, and that's just really expensive. And no one even tries these things directly. They try modifications on this, or do, do things like this on the dual problem or stuff like that, but no one even tries this on, on at least this kind of uh, objective because they're just really slow. They don't really, you have to sort of keep inverting x again and again. So because of that, um, people actually for a long time preferred things like proximal gradient methods and ADMM for problems, say like the graphical lasso. I'll show some results in a second, talking about how fast those can be. Um, but let's, let's sort of hold on to this idea of coordinate descent still and see what we can do, see if we can make it work. Um, and this is going to lead us to a, methods, a, a, a set of methods actually called Newton lasso methods. Um, or they're actually, they're also go, the, the general method here goes by also the name of proximal Newton methods. Um, and there's a whole wide hierarchy of these things that makes the names really actually hard to decipher sometimes because people talk about inexact proximal Newton methods and, and then exact proximal Newton methods. And it's really kind of confusing. But I'm going to call, describe this one algorithm here called a Newton lasso method. The idea is very simple. It's the same as Newton's method. So everyone here is familiar with Newton's method, right? By, by show of hands. Okay, most people. Um, Newton's method, you, you're minimizing some smooth objective. You form a quadratic approximation, you minimize that, and you keep going. All right, that's Newton's method. Um, Newton last, the Newton lasso method is the exact same thing. You first form a second order Taylor expansion of, of the fun around the current point, and then you solve the Newton step but you actually apply your L1 penalty within the Newton update itself. And importantly, you apply the penalty to x plus your difference delta. Right, so you're penalizing the L1 norm of sort of the next iterate you get if you take a full step. And so by doing this, this actually, first of all, this probably works. This actually will give you the solution to the uh, L1 regularized problem. And it will also sort of encourage sparsity in the right way because it penalizes sort of your next full step. So then if you take a full step of, uh, of your Newton step, you don't always do that, by the way. You sometimes need to use some sort of, sort of a, a smaller step. But by the end of Newton's iteration, you usually take a full step. Um, it'll start making your iterates sparser and sparser. Yeah? Uh, right, so that, that, that's the big question, right? It's because everyone knows that Newton's method is great. In theory, it takes very few iterations to get there, but the big problem is it's more expensive per iteration. So is it ultimately a win or not? And in fact, for big problems, solving this thing exactly is also really hard, right? This is a great big problem. The difference now is that this is a great big quadratic problem. So we've gone back to the realm of quadratic L1 problems which is nice, right? Now we know how to solve these. We spent all this time solving it, and in particular, we can solve it with coordinate descent. Or anything else. You can solve it with, any, with, with, with whatever you want. Um, 
But that's actually, so actually maybe I'll just go, go, go to the next slide. Um, I just have a bunch of text in these next few slides highlighting the, the key points I want to make. Um, so again, the, the key point here is that we've done all this. It seems like we've kind of come a long ways because we still have now an L1 problem to solve not just once, but for each Newton iteration, we have to solve a new L1 problem. Um, what's nice, though, is as I said, these are now quadratic L1 problems, and those are very easy to solve, or at least they're easier to solve. So we're going to take our favorite algorithm for L1 quadratic problems, namely coordinate descent, and we're going to apply it to solve the Newton update. This approach is called Newton coordinate descent. And uh, this is not our algorithm. This has been considered actually for a while. Some standard references are um, Sen, Seng, and Yun, 2009. This is, a, I think, a math, in mathematical programming. And then um, Kasey et al., this is uh, the group, uh, a group out of uh, E.T. Austin, applied this to the, to the uh, graphical lasso problem. And it is currently a state of the art in the graphical lasso. Um, so, so the nice thing here is that these are ultimately faster than other methods. Um, there are always, and I'll talk about the limitations in a second too, but in, in general, these are going to be much faster. And that seems a little bit odd at first because we've sort of taken this weird roundabout way. We're saying coordinate descent is too slow. Let's apply Newton's method and apply coordinate descent on that. Well, is that really any better than just coordinate descent on the original problem itself? Uh, and the answer is yes, it is. It is actually a lot better. The reason being that the computation we have to do, we would have to do every time, recomputing the gradient, recomputing the Hessian, every iteration of, coordinate, of normal coordinate descent is very costly. Whereas the Newton steps, they run coordinate descent for a fixed gradient in Hessian. Right, because Newton's method, you take the current Hessian to your current point, and the, so the current Hessian and the current gradient, and you solve for delta given those. And so essentially what you lose in you know, doing a lot of work per Newton step here, you, you, you make back up in the fact that each problem you're solving is much easier. Now, I should say one thing is the case, though. And this is where these problems are still not quite, they're definitely not as easy as things like proximal gradient methods or APMM. And the reason for that is you still have to take a lot of care in how you compute those inner products with the Hessian. Okay, because that can be actually be really time consuming to do it wrong. And really the, the art of these methods, and it still, still is kind of an art because they aren't, I think for each new problem you have to figure out how to do this for that problem. Um, but the idea is for each problem you need to figure out a way to compute these Hessian inner products faster than sort of the na naive time of redoing it every single time. So um, I'm being somewhat uh, hand wavy there, but maybe just showing here, you know, if these things in, in, the, uh, in the graphical lasso case, these things are themselves matrices. This is actually a, a um, it's really a tensor, but it's, uh, you can make it a great big matrix but the Kronecker product. Doing that analytically, sort of writing that down um, and doing it kind of in the naive way would be incredibly slow. Uh, so I'm not going to get into that, but it's just, just essentially all I'm saying here is you have to take care in how you actually compute those inner products. Otherwise, you can get in big trouble. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so we're not really updating. No, so, so the idea is we're actually not doing updates of the Hessian. We're computing the Hessian. We're actually, and we're not even computing the Hessian, because if you actually wanted to compute the full Hessian for all these things, it's just too big. What we're doing is we're coming up with an efficient way of computing inner products with the Hessian. Um, and we're doing that for a fixed Hessian at a fixed point. And then we take a Newton step and we do all that stuff again. So, so each time it's, it's a single Hessian, but we have to take a lot of different inner products with it. For each coordinate update, we have to essentially take one inner product with the Hessian, and we need a lot of coordinate updates. Yeah, we basically develop a fast way of computing inner product of this inner product right here is the, is the bottom line. And again, um, this is a bit more detailed than I wanted to get, or getting into how to do this was a little more than I wanted to get into. Um, maybe people, people here are really sad that I'm not doing that. Um, 
come talk, talk with me afterwards. It's, it's always fun to, to go into details here. But this is all I'm going to say sort of about the actual, the actual algorithm itself. Yeah? Right, so that's actually the, the other thing, which I actually have on a later slide, but realize I didn't put it here. Um, no, so you don't. You don't want to actually include all your, all your variables um, and, and let them all change every time. Just like in Corn Descent, you would actually loop over only your non-zero ones at first. Here you actually also maintain a set of variables that, have a certain, that meet a certain grading condition or that are non-zero. Let's say you're optimizing over the clock. Yes. Yes. Yeah, this is still batch optimization here. We're talking about actual batch methods. I mean, you could certainly do mini batch stuff if you want to do a stochastic version of this, but we're talking about batch, batch optimization. So we're assuming that you, you know, the data itself is is essentially for you know for the. Uh, I won't go back, but yes, yes. Yes, the delta here is sparse, and the x that you maintain at every point is sparse, too, ideally. So both of those are sparse. And you actually only allow yourself to make updates to, to delta in the coordinates where x is, is non-zero or has certain conditions, gradient conditions. Um, but, but yes, essentially, both these things are sparse, and they can be solved somewhat efficiently. Now, this one might spark. The, the Hessian here very well could not be sparse, right? In fact, it won't be sparse for a graphical lasso, for example. So the trick is still, how do you do these things when these things are both dense here? Uh, and that's sort of, the, again, the, the art of these methods still. They aren't yet a technology you can just sort of plug in. You have to, you have to adapt them to any given problem. All right, so let me just show sort of, and this is actually kind of graphs that are hard to read, but they basically show what I showed before. Um, this is a figure from this, this uh, NIPS paper that talked, I should say that was 2011. I had the year wrong there. Um, that talk about applying this to the graphical lasso problem, and essentially these lines here, I won't go into it, but these lines here are Newton corn descent, and the other things are, are existing algorithms for this problem. So for this problem, it was already kind of, this, or it already is sort of the state of the art in large scale solutions. Now I say large scale, actually, um, I should sort of clarify what I mean there. These are, you know, 2,000 to 2,000 matrices. There's, there's a lot of entries there, but they're sparse. Um, these methods have actually been currently scaled up to things like a million by a million variable matrices. So they do scale. Despite the fact that they are Newton methods, you can do tricks to make them scale up bigger. Um, but I'm not talking about that today. That's another whole another sort of, sort of set of, of tricks you need to do that. OK, so that's kind of the first bit of this talk. And I think I'll only get to one of these two examples right now, uh, probably the first of the two, uh, rather than try to go into too much depth. Uh, or try to go over them too fast. So um, are there any questions before I jump into the application now? Yeah? There's a lot of tricks they do for that. Um, they do block updating, but not in the way you're thinking about block coordinate descent, I, I, I think, because usually block coordinate descent means you update a whole set of variables in sort of a more analytic way first. Um, they don't quite do it like that, but there is, they, do, they do exploit block structure in the matrix, so yes and no. Um, that's sort of a whole other bit of work, though. Yeah? Right, so, so for the, that depends on the algorithm you're, on the precise optimization problem you're solving. So in general, for the naive method, um, say for the graphical lasso, to even compute the gradient here, the gradient involves an x inverse term. So you're going to be ultimately limited by just computing x inverse. Uh, and if you're going to compute it and do it exactly, that's going to be your limiting factor. So it's going to be order n, n cubed, essentially, where n is the you know, one dimension of x. Uh, and of course, you're going to have to do a lot of those things to get these updates. So it still seems to be in the order of n cubed, but that doesn't really limit the, the limiting factor there. Um, I guess, as I said, there's a ways of getting around that, but it's kind of tricky. Let me jump in now to one of these two problems. And I'll only talk about one because we don't have time to talk about both of them. Um, and I do want to highlight it because I do think this is an area where um, methods like this from machine learning ha are poised to make a very big practical impact 
in a very important domain in energy, and this is the problem of forecasting energy. So I'm going to talk about it now in terms of forecasting power from wind farms, um, but this can also be applied to forecasting you know, consumption, the people, how much people are going to consume, etc. So imagine you are a grid operator. You're controlling the electrical grid, and you have a bunch of wind farms across your state. One of the most common things you will need to do to operate the grid in the presence of these things is make predictions about how much power each of these farms is going to generate over the next, say, 24 hours. And you have to do this because you need to schedule your other generators to make up for whatever these can't produce. Right? And the better you can forecast these things, the better and sort of with less margin you can schedule everything else. You know, your coal plant, it's really bad for the environment, but which you, have to, but which you can turn on and off, unlike the wind. Uh, the better you can forecast, the better you can do that. And ultimately, you're, you're going to use a lot less energy doing this. Now, this is a hard problem, though, for a few reasons. Um, first of all, if you took sort of each forecasting point as a random variable, what you would find is that these are very highly correlated together, of course, right? So if you make a mistake an hour from now, there's a good chance to make the same mistake two hours from now. It's not like there are independent random variables here. Similarly, they're also correlated in space. So if you make a mistake on one wind farm, you know, over here, you'll probably make the same mistake at a wind farm a mile away. What we need, therefore, is a way of actually predicting the distribution over likely wind for a wide range of times and a wide range of locations. So we have both spatial and temporal correlations here that we want to capture. The way we're going to do this is with a model called the sparse Gaussian conditional random field. And this essentially is a discriminative analog of a sparse inverse covariance estimation. And it's one of these things that's obviously kind of a good idea. I know it's a good idea because three people came up with it at the exact same time. Um, as far as I know, without talking to each other. So actually, it was, this was funny because um, we went to a conference and people were talking about, oh yes, these people at CMU are doing this. And it was actually a different group at CMU. It's, it's the people whose office is, is right over there, but they're actually like across the way from my office. And I had no idea they were working these, these exact same problems. So it's sort of fun. But, but our real sort of contribution here was, was the algorithm that we applied to it. So um, as I say, the sort of the model I'll describe in a second, but then the, sort of the, the, the contribution here is, is, is this fast algorithm for actually optimizing it. So let me kind of give the basic model now. The idea is we have a bunch of output variables and a bunch of input variables. Output variables are y, inputs are x. And we want to model the distribution of y given x. Right? So we're, we're in the discriminative framework here, so we're not modeling the distribution over x, we're just modeling the probability of y given x. And we're going to model this as a exponential family with a quadratic term in y and a linear term in x. What this really means is that if we were only to look, so, so what this means is essentially these parameters here are specifications of the edges in this graphical model. And if we were only to look at connections between the y's, this would be exactly the same as estimating a Gaussian distribution. If we were to look at the only the, the uh, dependence between y and x, this would just be running linear regression on each of the outputs given all the inputs. And of course, if we include both of them, then we're doing both these things. Now, one thing to notice here is that with this distribution, the distribution is Gaussian, right? So, so the, the, the probability of y given x is going to be a Gaussian. It's going to be a Gaussian with this mean and this covariance. And the important thing here is that just like the sparse inverse covariance estimation case, these terms here, lambda and theta, can be sparse, meaning that there can be very few edges in this graphical model. Yet your covariance and the predictions themselves are actually, prediction matrices are actually full. So every prediction will depend on every single input. Sorry, every, yes, every prediction will, will depend on every input and they'll have a full covariance estimate, despite the fact that your inverse covariance and this theta parameter here are both sparse. So what this sort of boils down to is that you can capture 
very dense distributions and very dense correlations, which are going to happen, right? Because the actual correlation between you know, things like weather forecasts and wind power is going to be dense. That's going to sort of every place can, can be correlated with all these predictions. But yet the actual graphical model structure underlying it can be sparse. And that can help you learn these parameters with much less data, is the bottom line. So how do we go about actually learning this now? Well, if we want to learn a model like this that encourages these, all these parameters to be sparse, we're going to do it with the standard L1 penalty on them. So we have our, well, I didn't describe this yet. Basically, what happens is if you take this, this model here um, and write out the log likelihood of it, what you get is you get this term here. So I'm not going through the details of that. But you get a log determinant term, much like you do in sparse inverse covariance estimation. You get a trace term, again, just like the sparse inverse or the graphical lasso case. Um, and you get a term like this, which is actually this one right here is similar to what you would have in linear regression, essentially. Um, you have your L1 penalties here, all sort of the same, all kind of things that can be dealt with with, with existing algorithms so far. But you also have this very nasty term here called a matrix fractional term. So this term has an inverse of one parameter and then a quadratic term and another two parameters. And that one is really nasty. Um, it's really sort of, it's still convex, uh, but they're really hard to, you know, it's, it, it's gradient, it's already nasty, it's Hessian is even nastier, um, and it's hard to deal with. So this is the hard term here. It's convex, but hard to deal with. And so again, as no surprise now, what we're going to do is we, what, we, what we've done here is we've developed a um, Newton coordinate descent method for this. The details are on the next slide, but they're not actually important. Um, I'm just showing it to sort of make it look complicated or, or, or impress upon you the fact that it is complicated. Um, but the point is you sort of crank through the machinery, you develop this Newton coordinate descent method, and then you kind of apply this kind of art to figure out how can you pre-compute certain terms to make the algorithm more efficient. That's more or less what we've done here. Um, so here is, for example, the second order approximation. Uh, it's the longest equation I've ever had on a set of slides before. And I wouldn't have put it there. You're not supposed to get anything out of that. But I wouldn't put it there other than to sort of impress upon you that these are really, really nasty terms here that we have to use or sort of deal with in order to form these methods. Now, the key to actually doing well on this, though, is, as I said, to, to pre-compute certain products, or not pre-compute them, but also kind of store them in, in, in their inter intermediate form. Namely, you want to store uh, the, the, your sort of update to lambda times lambda inverse, and you update to theta times lambda inverse. And you can update these things efficiently and kind of cache certain products, and everything works out well. The details are all in the paper. They're actually, I think, in, in the appendix of the paper, right? They're not even in the main paper, because they're just so kind of they're, they're very important for the actual performance, but we also have code that you can just download and then, then use instead. Um, so that's the algorithm. Take this model, it's convex but really nasty, um, apply Newton coordinate descent, and see how it works. And as I said, I guess I'm not going to show it again, but that, um, that graph that I showed you at the first slide was actually this problem. Maybe actually I'll go back all the way um, just, just to do it. Uh, but these graphs, this was this problem. So for a problem with about 4 million parameters, um, you can learn these models in about a minute with our method as opposed to hours with other things. All right. How does it actually work on wind forecasting? Um, very, very briefly, and I'm not going to get into the, into the actual data here too much at all. Um, we developed this model for, uh, or based upon the, uh, a Kaggle contest. Are you familiar, familiar with Kaggle? It's a machine learning competition site. It was a contest on wind forecasting. Uh, it ran in two years ago, or a year and a half ago now. And the goal was to predict wind power at seven farms over the next 48 hours. And these farms were close together, so there was spatial correlation and temporal correlation. Um, you're also given a bunch of history of this thing, about 840 different observations from the past, and you're asked to essentially make future predictions. Now, 
This model is actually a little, a little, at a little bit of a disadvantage here because it's really a probabilistic model and they were evaluating it just based upon mean forecasts themselves. So just based upon sort of the average, how, how far were you on average from them? And even on that, it still did very well. So I, I will say uh, we didn't compete with this model in the contest. Actually, the, the contest finished before we had developed all this. Um, but using essentially a bunch of very hand-tuned features and just linear regression, we got fifth place already in the contest. Um, so that was actually a reasonable performance just based on basically on you know, what you do when you want to do well, which is feature engineering, right? For a, for a fixed contest like this. Um, and now, given that, taking these same features and applying this method to it, um, a couple things, actually, let me all show this slide first. So, a couple, so, so what we get is we get much better performance than we did on the contest or than even the winner in the contest did, though I should also sort of hedge myself a little bit and say that um, we don't actually have a true training set or a true testing set. We just sort of see in cross-validation we seem to do a lot better. Um, okay, so if we take least squares, we get a root mean squared error of, of, of a certain amount. And again, these numbers aren't really that important here. Um, the point is that this was fifth place in the contest and it was already very, very hand-tuned. We take those exact same features, apply our model, and we get quite a bit better improvement, about 5% improvement over that. Um, and that was a lot better than the difference between the best entry and our entry in the contest. So uh, we sort of wish we could go back in time, but we can't do that, I guess. So yeah, what was there? Yeah, this has a it is, but not, not the testing set. So yes, the training set is available, though. Yeah. Yeah. OK, great. Oh, fantastic. Oh. Oh, yeah, so this is available uh, publicly, yeah. Um, and so I forget if I have, okay, I don't have any more slides on this, but, but, but um, I, I also will say just informally another thing uh, is that the fact that this is well on the mean is actually only really part of the story here, right? The really nice thing about this model is that you're able to draw samples from this distribution which much more accurately reflect the true co um, the true co correlations and covariance of the actual wind than it would if you were just, say, treating everything as, a, as an independent random variable. That would be a horrible idea, and that would actually give you a very bad sense of how much extra energy to, to provision because you have to take into account the fact that your errors are correlated when you decide how much energy you're going to plan, you know, your coal plant to generate and things like this. So I'm not going to get the second one. The second one is actually an application in control rather than just learning. So we're actually designing controllers, meaning we're taking, uh, designing sort of the, the, the logic that will look at observations in a grid and determine how much power each plant should generate in order to maintain stability in the grid. Um, this is actually not a convex problem. It involves really nasty uh, expressions because even evaluating the objective actually involves a, what's called the solution to a Lyapunov equation which are solvable, but they're kind of nasty. Um, and so that's the, that's the objective, let alone the Hessian and the gradient. Um, and so we actually have to go through a lot of steps to get this to be efficient and, 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 a, and a fast method. So a lot of fun stuff there, but I'm going to unfortunately have to skip over, over most of that. So let me just finish now uh, and, and make two points. What I hope to convince you of in this talk is, is really two things. The first is that if you have a hard L1 problem, you should think about using these methods. Um, if it's quadratic, then, then just use what else is out there. If you have a really big, hard uh, L1 problem with a non-quadratic loss, uh, think about these methods because they sometimes, and if done right, can be much faster than everything else that I know about. And secondly, uh, kind of, I only got a chance to show you one of these, but secondly, um, there really are a huge range of problems that are at the intersection of power systems and sustainability and energy and machine learning. Uh, it's an area that has not gotten nearly as much attention as say biology or vision or these kind of things, but I think it's poised to, machine learning is poised to have as big an impact in this space as it has in those spaces. Um, and so I hope I can inspire some people to come, come chat with me, come think about these problems uh, because there's a huge range of problems in this area and they all can have a really, really big impact on the future, the future of energy. So thank you.